Thank you. Thank you, everybody that is watching us now live. Uh, to those who will be watching the record and uh, to those that are, uh, are now live with us. Uh, I am Camilo uh, Amaral, a professor at the Federal University of Goiás, and I will be the chair of this session. Today we will have, uh, uh, we are having a problem with the audio. Okay, so I think it's my computer, sorry. So I'm gonna fix that, all right, it was my computer. So today we are here for the lecture of uh, Professor Camilo Buano. Uh, we have an expectation of about uh, 50 minutes, one hour. It is titled uh, uh, Urbanism of Exception, the Camp and Inhabitation. And at the end, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, questions and answer session. So please share your comments and questions on the, on the chats and uh, both in YouTube and Facebook. Uh, so we will collect them and uh, share in the, and discuss it in the, the end of the lecture. Please identify your institution and the city where, or the city where you, you're speaking from, so we can have a, a reference from where you're speaking. Uh, for those who are wishing for a cer certificate, please find the link of a Google form in the description and uh, in the, the chat. Uh, this lecture is part of the Permanent Forum uh, Project City and Processes, and it is an uh, initiative of the post-graduation program Project and City. Uh, uh, also, uh, initiative of the Project Process Lab, and uh, it is in partnership with the journal Jatoba. So please find the links of those in the description too. Uh, this forum has had uh, different formats other years, but this year we went uh, virtual and global. So we are entering this new dimension. Uh, but uh, it's also due to this uh, difficult situation that we are living with the pandemics of COVID. So we would also like to share uh, solidarity with the families that were affected by it and also encouragement for those who are treating the sick. Uh, this uh, new forum aims to discuss the different processes of project and analysis of the city and also uh, to think how we can uh, think about the city itself as a social process. So it's focused on critical ways of, of uh, thinking the city and the possible and impossible ways uh, to intervene on it. So considering these challenges and uh, the, the crisis we are facing today, which involves like economic crisis, political crisis, ecological crisis, humanitarian crisis, maybe it's the most uh, in the focus of this lecture today and also our latest uh, sanitary cr uh, crisis. So uh, now I will uh, introduce you to our speaker today. Then we are very glad to, to have Camilo, Professor Camilo Buono with us. You have almost the same name as me, but uh, uh, with uh, one extra L, which makes a difference in Italian, not so much in Portuguese. Uh, will be speaking for us virtually from Turin. So thank you very much for accepting to share your th provoking thoughts and cross-disciplinary approach with us today. I think it will be very helpful for our uh, aims in our research and our discussions. Uh, professor Camilo Buano is a professor of urban design and critical theory at the Bartlett Development Planning Unit and uh, he's also uh, entered now as a professor uh, of architecture and urban design at the DIST, which is the Departamento Inter, uh, Inter Ateneo de Ciência, Projeto e Politique e Territorio of the Polytechnic of Turin. So he's also here, like uh, divided between different countries and cities. He's also a co director of the Urban Laboratory at the UCL. Uh, University College of London, where they, they are engaged in many uh, research across the globe. Boano research is centered in a complex encounter and discussion between critical theory, radical philosophy, and also urban design processes. So he's very uh, keen to our goals all 
his arguments. He's especially engaged with informal urbanizations, urban collective uh, actions, as well as uh, crisis generated urbanism with a specific focus on migration, borders, and the urban project. He is working in a series of interconnected research projects, which includes uh, Latin America, South Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, he, he had worked several, uh, in several research and consultancies on camps, uh, cities, and migration. He also has a, a vast list of publications uh, with many edited books. Of, uh, some of them you can find, some selected uh, papers you can find in the links in the commentary. And you can also find a lot of things in his academia, academia.edu profile. He's also author of the book, uh, The Ethics of Potential Urbanism, Critical Encounters Between George Agamben and Architecture. And the link you can find here below. Uh, so please uh, find these this books. They are very interesting and uh, it's very connected. He has a really recent and very interesting paper also on forms of collective life that is in an architecture and culture journal, which is a great journal. And um, or also from an association which uh, kind of mediated uh, our encounter. We are both now in touring at distance, but we firstly met in, uh, in UK. So uh, with no more delays, I would like uh, to, to please uh, welcome you very warmly and uh, for delivering your lecture, Professor Camilo Buono. Hello, oh, hola, buen dia, and thank you very much for the introduction, very generous, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. I'm um, very thrilled, and uh, I, I hope to be able to uh, communicate and engage into a conversation with uh, you. Thank you for everyone has been working up the setting and Camillo for inviting me. It's been a privilege to uh, funding you back in Turin where we can have uh, other um, sets of conversation. Um, I've, uh, I've decided to talk about uh, the relationship between camps and exceptions and trying to uh, articulate that. I'm going to read the sometimes during uh, to a script so to make it much more uh, easy for everyone to follow. So the paper uh, is focused on space of refuge that represent a paradoxical encounter between a series of governmental forces, disciplinary knowledge, aesthetic regimes and spatial conditions that tend to arrest, fix in time and space forms of life. Such strategy is complemented more recently globally with the one of substructions where camps are playing the role of accelerated mobility dispositive, taking off the possibility of migrants, refugees and people in movement to settle, to pose in their trajectory of migration, choice and ultimately of inhabitation. Now, considering the fact that camps are meant to be the materialization of temporal status, spatial and political, this talk is addressing two different but interconnected points. In one respect, I hope to rescue Giorgio Agamben's work from its linear reading by commenting on the depolitization of the camp and the critique of its exceptionalism. And on the other, I wish to provoke a reflection around the universal claim of hospitality and full assimilation by introducing a disruptive or provocative terminology of inhabitation. Now, the rubric or the, 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 the concepts of inhabitation is a result of an affirmative daily strategies of learning, navigating, governing the possibilities of life in a city, in an urban context. By expanding the notion of dwelling to include other intersecting forms of caring, repairing, and imagining a future. So I'll try to substantiate the concept of inhabiting as a relational practice occurring in a marginal and fragile environment constituted by multiple incremental and transformative acts. 
to wish to ultimate propose to hold and resist marginalization. Now, I'm referring specifically to some of the work published recently on a numbers of different uh, empirical research, but I'm not delving into uh, their detail uh, very specifically. Camps are contentious, even in their definition. Humanitarian oriented literature has evolved from the rigid design description towards a more open-ended appreciation of what the camp is and what it does for the people that are in. But camps has also be discussed in other fields of knowledge and practice. Similarly, progressive trajectory, which convey the nuances of complexity implicit, implicit to their development. What emerge are a broad category that touch upon the camp and its contemporary symbolism. And other are some more explicit literature that trace back the camp to uh, the reflection on the colonial mode of population control capitalism and extraction. Camps, in a way, are sharing an intimate history with different forms of colonialism and genocide uh, that are a very specific fundamental element to be analyzed, although I don't have very much time to go into detail that. In broader terms, the camps are meant to provide a space of security for this displaced population when they are in the most vulnerable states. We can, of course, complexify and put the camp at the center of complex tensions of power relation and space to control, orient migration and to organize hierarchically as a space and its borderscape. If we use the notion of dispositive developed by Michel Foucault and subsequently by Giorgio Agamben, two fundamental authors in the development of a more philosophical and critical reflection on the camp as a spatial product or a series of political forces, not just the place of aid, neutral and benevolent, but part of a wider spatial assemblages across sovereignties and borders. Michael Agir argued that camps can be space where people who are thought to be undesirable might be confined and segregated from the clean, healthy, visible world, or space where people struggle and have no autonomy whatsoever. Spaces of refuge, shelter practices, or camp, however you want to and wish to define them semantically, represent a paradoxical encounter between a series of governmental forces disciplinary knowledge, aesthetic regime, and spatial condition. As a simple starting point, the camp remain a rare object of study that can exist simultaneously in the realm of theory, in the space of materialization, and in the form of a multiple agency that is emerged in it. It's in an ideological thought. It's heavily located and loaded by uh, political semantics. We know well that paradoxically camp are transcending their exceptional temporality, creating the condition for its transformation from a pure humanitarian space to an active political space, the embodiment on the ex expression of the right to return as fundamental experience of the Palestinian camps all over the Middle East are telling us. So, as a matter of elusive synthesis, I see camps emerging as a space of evolution from a Foucauldian biopolitics that put life in the preservation at the center of politics, an Agambanian Tanato politics that inverted the letting leave making die of the sovereign, and also the Mbembian necropolitics embedded in a colonial duress that let die and making leave very central, substantially manipulating the tension between place, space, power, and body. Spaces of refuge camps, however, are very much fundamentally a diagram of forces of exclusion, temporality, and control that has been rendered very differently into my research. So as a starting point, the camp is very much, as I said, uh, a formal dispositive, one that antagonized the spatial precept of modernism through its heavily loaded political semantics. We know well, paradoxically, the camp are transcending their exceptional temporality and becoming the condition for the transformation. So in a way, the camp become a political fact in space and in time. 
Although frequently repeated and often contested in its depoliticizing and exceptionality, Giorgio Agamben's suggestion that the camp is the nomos of our time remains a powerful idea, not only as it stands for the ubiquity of the camp as a preferred matrix to signify the space of refuge, existing in parallel relationship with state violence and migration containment, but also as an original component of a wide ranging disciplinary technology of governance of different forms of multiple biopolitical elements that controls, contain population of life and impede the people to settle, to live, to develop a fully fledged life that I later would call inhabitation. The point here is that rather than think of a camp and the city as a simple duality, we should direct our attention to the multiple forms of encampment that Michael Agir suggests as a spatial tactics of control in the creation of docile subjectivity, but also as a form of indistinction whereby the subject become a whatever, a very generic in Agambenian terminology. And this will allow to grasp the overall configuration, the landscapes, the network, and the mechanism of a regional and global level, extending the interpretative framework from spaces of exclusion and exception to a more complex liminal and transitionary space. In a way, the point that I'm trying to make is that they're abandoning the role of being purely exceptional and marginal, to become political space where vital subjectivities are emerging. The camp and the city are not fixed in their specific category, but are rather a sort of topological relationship between them. So let's return for a moment to the Agamben epigrammatic statement that he made in probably one of the most fundamental uh, um, fundamental um, book that he has, the Homo Sacer, Sovereign Power and Bear Life. And he says that today is not the city, but rather the camp that has the fundamental biopolitical paradigm of the West. Certainly, it does not mean returning to the specific historical moments that gave birth to the concentration camp in Germany, Rather, he think of a specific mode of production of territory, space, and identity. The camp for Giorgio Agamben is a paradigm that once embedded in a given historical situation is a tool, is a concept for understanding the present situation. Agamben's goal is to render intelligible a series of phenomena whose relationship is one to another has escaped or might escape in the historian Gazet. Therefore, the central gesture is to rescue such a political project and to understand the camp as an example, as a paradigm that in a way suspend the relation from within, from its being. In a way, citing and quoting him, one instance of a class and conversely, the class superventing control over the example is deactivate. For Agamben, the camp is the most absolute biopolitical space that has ever been realized in the history. Now, whether he plays that emerging in the colony or emerging in Germany, this has been a big debate. And of course, rendering in a very specific geohistorical dimension is one of the more critical elements that has been to rise to Agamben. However, for this reason, in any case, he is the paradigm of a political space in which we live. And he called the hidden matrix, the new biopolitical way of a planet. So in a way, moving from a specific geography is transcending into a global phenomena, a global mechanism that is constructing space and territory. Therefore, when considered as such, the camp is, a, is it in and its excess of politics, both historically and spatially, become a fundamental paradigm to interpret the present. A camp environment is a phantasm of a camp legacy, is ungraspable materialization of a layered politics, economies and network, operating in topologies that are claim and reclaim to the violence of the dispositive of the bare life. This is the camp nature, an image that is not fixed, but is still implacable and exceptional. Not the thing, Agaben says, but the thing's knowability, so the possibility of knowing it. 
Following other studies is less important to focus on the camp per se, but rather on the diagram of the camp in its field of tensions between the surrounding area, in the field of tension with the different mechanism and technologies that define control subjectivities and subjection in a way that construct norm and exception, terror and hope, in a way that are more complex and less binary while preserving the urgency of a critique of a camp. The camp is not the matrix of internal and exterior, in and out, exception or not exception, is a more complex ma matrix of a colonial regime that constructs subjectivities across scales. In the opening speech of the academic year in Rome last year, Giorgio Agamben asked directly to the audience, what could have been the historical a priori, the arche in Latin, of today's modern architecture? In answering, he posited that architecture exists because man is a dwelling entity, a dweller and its inhabitant. Now, the use of man is, of course, a critical dimension for him, allowing a different non-humanist version or a multiple human version of the whole, but however, is his own language that we have to criticize. And therefore, the connection between building and dwelling is a possible as a historical a priori of architecture and the condition of its possibility. So why this historical a priori is important here? Agamben suggests that the historical a priori, the origin, the arche, is the impossibility or the incapacity of dwelling for the contemporary human. And consequently, for architects, planner, it is important to break down the relationship between the art of building and the art of dwelling, creating, creating uh, the condition uh, for emergence of what Ivan Illich called the disabling profession the act of monopolizing an activity, expropriating uh, an individual from the capacity, in this case, of building in habitation. This impossibility of building and dwelling is the essence of the camp. Recalling that Auschwitz was built by an architect that was name was called Karl Bischkoff, who in October 1941 drew the first master plan for a facility designated to hold 97,000 inmates with Fritz Erth, a graduate from the Bauhaus. Agamben asked, how could it be possible that an architect build a structure in which under no circumstances what is possible to dwell in the original sense of being at home? Building the perfect place of the impossibility of inhabitation is the matrix of the camp. With this example, he portrayed how architecture at the present is facing an historical condition of building the inhabitable. With no inhabitation, only building physical is possible, and the camp is a matrix of exception still persists. So let me go into two kind of images that I ground in order to substantiate the shift of the argument of moving from a camp as a matrix of exception to inhabitation as its own possible redemptions, if you want. On one side, you have Uzai, Beirut, that has been a destination for multiple displaced groups over time. Currently is hosting approximately about 10,000 Syrian refugees. The silent informal structure of the existence of a series of social network and infrastructure in Uzai offer the displaced an alternative access to the city, allowing them to escape the gaze of the humanitarian aid, the apparatuses that reduce them to a statistics and further contribute to their vulnerability. Refugees are engaged in the production of a makeshift housing in two forms, Firstly, between owner and former Syrian refugees, and secondly, between the refugees themselves. The resultant is an imperfect co collective safeguard that Syrian refugees from the possible social discrimination and political threats. Uzai grants them a sufficient opacity to protect relationship and their being in the city. On the other side, 
Kilangtan Jia in Jangon, Myanmar, Burma, is the highest informal population in the city. An unplanned arrangement of bamboo shack with basic services, precarious con constructed on swampy lowland and under the patchwork of tenure condition, ranging from insecure renters to squatters and, and slumlord. In the mid 2000s, inhabitants started mobilizing to claim their housing rights and subsequently starting uh, saving groups to collectively purchase large plot of vacant or empty farmland for the purpose of building their own houses. Collective savings develop financial and social capital and capabilities for collective decision making and action. A collective life that allows them to become urban and to assert their existence in the city. A collective, although precarious, forms of living. Now, Huzai and Langtan Dia are distant places, both geographically and from each other. They could be considered margin, peripheries, south. From the argument I'm trying to make, that it should not be treated as exceptional space. Rather, they demonstrate, as do many other places of that kind in the world, the salient features of our living in the city, the presence of other, and the perennial tension uh, between dwelling practices and inhabitable condition. A form of collective life, in the word of Abdul Malik Simon, is pretty much the particular ways in which bodies, things, space, and the relationship among them mutually compose themselves in gender dynamic, uneven, inventive, and intensively problematic experience and expression for those who inhabit them. The middle co of contradictory trajectory of urbanization replete with both fervish dynamism, with the new capacities for connection, knowledge, and repository and being induced in all kinds of residence, as well inertia, feeling that residents are stuck in outmoded place, occupation, and relationship, Abdul Malik Simon would have said. So forms of life in Kuzai and Ilangtar are examples of many sides of the urban world that bring to the fore the necessity to consider the creative forces entailing such politics where making life collectively is a continuous affirmation confronting the negative form of precarity, exclusion and dispossession. Such affirmation and the centrality of life in their form are at the center of any urbanization. Such uh, uh, and therefore, let me to project the rubric of inhabitation as the capacity to care, to connect, to repair, to hold together, as well to capacity to capacity to imagine and experiment with alternative life force to oppose politics of oppression and capitalist extraction of value. Inhabitation could possibly become the territory where the practice of care, repair, and imagination forge a renewed politics in an ontology of the living. So viewed from Uzai, Uzai or Ilantar or anywhere else in the world of the South Global East, urban condition in the pressure of unsustainability and inequality core for a reflection about the nature of being in the world and the nature of the space that we build. As Roberto Esposito reminds us, every political thought imply a conception of space time of the world and the human. On one hand, every philosophical definition of being a necessary has a political effect. On the other, a mode of being, starting from the being able, the capacity, is what express the political tension in the relationship of generate. So thinking about inhabitation is not new and is just illusionary for us to think, but is a way to repurpose the tension between exception and the bare life, the, 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 the complete alienation of life to something more positive, more, more emancipatory, if you want. Of course, thinking about inhabitation is not new. Uh, Henri Lefebvre inhabitants is very central or the work of Arturo Escobar uh, that is in a single condition of fundamental habitability that you use to reflect on the collective calling for a different notion of human, a way of life that is very much relational with the universe. Now, well, let me return to the fundamental enigma that Agamben says, which is uh, the bare life. 
In Homo Sacer, he says that uh, he said that the, uh, a search for means, ways, forms, and life through which a new politics can be arrived, and it's called at its heart through the voice of another on every pages of the book. This search for new politics for Agamben is unquestionably urgent. For Agamben, the transformation for our political life, stripped bare, naked, is what the state of exception is. That is rapidly came in the rule in the East, in the West. And this is what Agamben believed our, 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 every act of us should counteract. Now, in order to oppose to the notion of bare life, to the naked life, the central of the exception, he put up a counter figure of such a bare life that he called forms of life, in which is never possible, which is a life that is never possible to isolate something like bare life. In Agamben terminology, such forms of life are new uses of the body that frame an existence that is not generic but imperfect a possibility of life that is evident in the condition of the informal urbanization globally that suggests the positive agency of marginalized community. The possibility is described as an alter spectrum of what is possible within the bound of the law, reworking, of course, the negative that and they endure and repair into the processes, uh, or establishing new relation, negotiation deter, or make their very reality a craft of new forms of life. In such a plastic indistinction, forms of life are emerging as spatial violations in the language of my colleague Samar Makusi, and they are demonstrating the multiple system that are made by people, things, and forces, in which the displaced are acting with different degrees of agentive capacity in shaping the material condition of the space. They also signify as a case of, of the many concrete slab, as a dispositive of the city yet to come, of the unfinished, indirecting, generic, undomestication condition that emerge. So rescuing the camp as a forms of life allow for a more complicated and more affirmative reflection of a Gambian powerful political process. And in the dark exceptionality, by stressing it as a space, and as a terrain constituted by both the actual and the possible. And this is referring both to the histories that have shaped the urban trajectory, economy, and identity, habits and practices, popular constructions, and migrant agency. So the forms of life that presuppose inhabitation become the central idea that might help us to think how we practically live together and also how the norms and the tactics of such life get informed in and through space. A territorial spatial outlook of such form of life casts the cities, neighborhood, and community not only as a site of refuge, but a space where right can be pro produced, space where the struggle for inhabitation takes place. Inhabitation here means recentering the affirmative dimension of enduring relationship and develop the idea of collective life that tenaciously responds, non negatively, to the aspect of life and the mode of living that are extractive and that obscure horizons of hope. So, to do so, we might think on forms of caring, repairing, and form of imaging that also has been resurrected in, in COVID time, that elements that constitute an imagination. While, of course, some of these are elusive and almost immediately to grasp of in any collective existence and in our personal embodied experience, their articulation can be made more specific and political when is connected with the work of anthropologists as uh, Puig de la Bella Casa, Joan Tronto, uh, uh, or, or, or Gautam Ban, or even uh, Arturo Escobar. When caring practices are at play in inhabitation, they make a collective life visible. When care as a process of holding together, both materially and temporally, is conducive to the notion of maintenance, repair, and imagination. Inhabitation become another infrastructure of care, allowing the emergence of an ontology that is interestingly pragmatic and performative, never bare, never abandoned. Shannon Mattern suggests that we never far from reach three enduring truths. Maintainer require care, 
caregiving require maintenance. And in the distinction between, between these practices are shaped by race, gender, class, and other political economy and cultural forces. In other words, the relational dimension infused in such practice constitute political ontologies that relate to the political question of being and becoming, allowing the possibility of different forms of life is that I have the potential to transform and resist the mode of dominance over life generated by the rupture of the obsolescence of the world. Inhabitation is not only endurance in the present, but it also has the difficult task of imagining possible future that support a new affirmative forms of life, recomposing response to a different materiality and multiplicity in the present and in the future. So, inhabitation is thinking and imagining the future. Bodies, idea, identity of all kind are the provisional alignment of this physics, which give blood, flesh, and the power to the energy of things. A more dynamic process of formation and imagination become a space in which many meanings, bodies, and material operate in public, in motion. Inhabitation, as imagination, is where both ethics and politics coexist. The practice of inhabitation supports the ethics and paraphrasing Agamben, the process of the living are never simply facts, but always and above possibilities of life. Life is experienced as a threshold between speech and noise, political life, nude life, human and animal. Destroying and reconstructing opposition between inclusion and exclusion, oppression and emancipation, citizenship and non-citizen, formal and informal, camp and non-camp, suggest a new ethics in the camp can help us to think through it. It is found not by including form of excluded life, but actually occupying law and language in a zone of indistinction where life is neither silent nor passive, not fully captured in language and action. The camp is a paradigmatic reading and the form of life it generates help us to think beside an exceptional and move to inhabit such indistinction. I want to leave with this uh, picture and thank you very much because what I found extremely important into sharing with you the paper is to move beyond the nature of the exception as a totalizing force that has been constructed into a very specific set of paradigm and moving, imagining a different antidote that in the Agamben terminology is a forms of life that I see very much as a way of inhabiting the present and imagining the future. So thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's uh, incredible work, very deep philosophically but also taking into account something that is really important to, to us. It's like a, an urgent question today about this crisis, humanitarian crisis and uh, uh, these movements. And uh, I think you also bring how it is interconnected with uh, road system. So thank you very much. And also really interesting the, the diagrams that you developed because uh, it uh, creates a synthesis in a, in a picture of uh, the relations that are tied together in this all this process, and um, I, I would like uh, before we have some questions here, I would like to to ask you some uh, before that uh, um, in some other uh, papers of you you speak about uh, an ontological turn, um, and I would like uh, you to to speak a little bit more about this this change of perspective when you build the notion of uh, inhabitation if it is um, a move uh, somehow uh, to a relational existentialism kind of uh, existentialism that is always mediated by the connection and how this is brought together and some and another idea that you have that uh, i think is really important to understand this this context is that uh, uh, becoming or being today is also, and I quote, being able to be. So how I maybe there is like a where you live persons, 
they are able or not to leave, that's uh, the place where power and suggestion and uh, uh, and control of possibilities are. And um, I would like you, uh, if you could talk a little bit more about uh, this ontological turn in your reading of Agamben. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, so, so there are two answer. I I started working with Agamben a while back, and uh, and I found the political process, the intellectual process, quite uh, important for my own development. But while I was developing all my reflection and engagement with different fields of research, I also found that there was a number of other scholars that were offering uh, sort of very critique to his own thinking. And therefore, I've been continuously, I'm not a philosopher, I'm an architect, and I was continuously engaging with the combination between different thoughts in order to produce a way of understanding not only the matrices of power, so the, the, the knowledge uh, power relation, if you want, but also finding alternative way to politicize and politicize and political issues was something that was not never emerging so directly into uh, the work of Agamben. Agamben was always thought to be dark, uh, misleading and negative. And so my work was trying to compensate some of his own thoughts, not because I, I, I had the, you know, the, the expectation to compensate any of these kind of great thinker, but simply to cross with other uh, reflection. Therefore, the notion of ontology came very clearly because for him is the notion of being and being able to is a terminology that he actually developed and developed very clearly rereading the laws and rereading a specific element. Now, in his last book uh, that closed the sessions of Homo Sacha, the, the big project of Homo Sacha, and the title is The Use of the Body, he ends the project saying something that I found it extremely important that opens to the ontology, which is the notion of a destituent power. So a power that is ne never able to reproduce itself with its own same institution, so a new, a new reality, a new institution, uh, but always trapped into it and rather contrasting with something that is more destituent, always in change, always in being. Therefore, the ontology, which is a sort of very academic and strange terminology, but for me is being. And being is always that capacity of never being completely shuttered down and naked uh, in the bare life uh, analysis. So for me, being and ontology were very central to appreciating the resistance, the power, the collective dimension of the territory of the pieces and the people that I was working and I keep continuous working with. So that was the way to rescue the negativity through a being that is able to continuously resist and resisting to the imposition of a project. Thank you for the, the your perspective. And uh, we have here uh, a question. Maybe I'm going to make two questions together because they are a little bit connected. One is from the professor Adriana Maravas, who is also a teacher at the our uh, research program. And she's asking, are refugee camps and slums facing the same coin of racialization of space that is inserted in the necropol necropolitics of many governments at the same time. And uh, we have another question from uh, Louisa Dyer, which is a student from UFG, and uh, uh, is in Portuguese, I'm going to translate to you. Camilo, uh, the favelas can also be taught as uh, permanent camps. What would be the differences in trying to think that? Your microphone is off. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes, yeah. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> uh, um, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, okay. Uh, let's start from the the other one. Um, for sure, they shared the same. Okay. Let's start from the beginning. I do not see camps and favelas or informal settlement completely separated. 
I see those spaces as both possibly to be constructed around this logic of exception, but the exception is not the exception because of their exceptionality, but the exception because they are able, they are part of a dispositive, so it's a matrix, a space that construct a reality that constructs specific forms of subject. So create subjectivation. Of course, and it's absolutely natural now that there is no other way to compensate with a Gambian version of exceptionality with other forms of rationalization, extractions, and expulsion that are very present to the capitalist system. So in a way, they are biopolitical matrix. So they are biopolitical tool that put the life of the inmates at very risk either protecting them more towards the model of the refugee camps that we know or as letting them die if you want another terminology in a more uh, uh, favelian vision now the trouble of this logic is that they do not they do not work as two opposite side neither they work as a territorial what i call topological so they works at territory that has some forms of manifestation of exceptions control but certainly create a subject and create a fundamental subject that is either completely banned and marginalized or extracted to these forms of technological or technologies of ban technology of exception technology of exclusion could take myriad of forms historically have taken differently at the present they take in different and continually they take differently uh, the example is for ex at the moment is that we have territories in Europe that works as a camp, but they are borders. They are territories between states, but they act uh, spatially, constructing subjectivity and actually excluding. But the exclusion is not a separation, the exclusion is an inclusion. So there is a sort of very figures of disjunctive inclusion, so where those two dimensions. So you're definitely right, and rationalization is central, and it's central because create, in any case, a colonial stigma around bodies, around the identity, and around their value, the capital value. And I do believe that this is an extraction that we continually have to do it. Now, in reality, if you want, in, in a more less uh, typological sense, of course, the, 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 those territory are forms of an urbanization that of exception. So exception is a central as a matrix. Their very form is not what is important. The very aesthetics is not what is important. What is important is what they do. And what they do for the individual, for the collective possibility, and to the rejection. So the two questions are connected. There are people that tended to think camps and cities very different, very separate, and also is also a very literal sense of what Agamben will say. Is the, this is not the key, he says this is not the city, the, 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 the paradigm of the of the present, but is the camp. And this is very useful to think about this exceptionality. But on the other side is very non-useful, you know, less useful to think the way in which we construct through exception, through subjection, and through rationalization, and through neocolonialism, the form of otherness that has to be either completely expanded, excluded, or really included in a different manner. But the mechanisms are absolutely the same. The nomenclature could change and has been changing across in the different literature. Well, uh, we have another uh, question from John, which, which is also uh, a student of uh, UFG, and he's asking, uh, Camilo, I'm going to translate, uh, uh, to defend the perman permanence of people in favelas, like uh, regularization campaigns, including uh, the help uh, uh, in a tourism discourse in, the, in those communities would be a kind of a romanticization of uh, poverty. And he also said, uh, to defend the favelas uh, would be to defend the right to the city. How would be the right to the city in this case? Yeah. Yeah, I, it's a very interesting question again. I There was another... In another question, there was the tension between permanency and, and temporariness. Uh, 
temporal impermanence, I think, originally in the camp, camp literature has been thought to be two, two different conditions. Rather, if we embrace this idea of habitation, so the possibility of life to emerge, being temporary or being permanent is less a category, useful. Reason is that we have uh, favelas that uh, looks like temporal, but they have been historical tendency of growing together and connecting and ameliorating uh, through different forms of regular regulation, different forms of connection, whether we have camps that has been historically there for more than 80 years. So the question is that neither, neither temporary nor permanence to me qualify the exception nor the exclusion. They do some of this, but they do not. So what if we put in tensions the permanency and the temporary and we start making some more nuances version, a temporal permanence, a permanent temporality? Whether we mix those terminology, I think we're going to have a different forms and different reflection because they allow this possibility of inhabitation. And inhabitation is somehow one of my way of connecting with the right to the city. I'm not using right to the city in that very specific terminology because to me is less a right, but I understand what you're saying. So probably is we're going in the same direction, but I'm saying that if the camp is a territory that is not built for life, that life to emerge is a pathway toward the right to the city. Uh, in the very specific normative uh, version and discursive dimension that you have in Brazil, specifically on the right of the city, yes, probably is that. But this is, might not be the same in other parts of the city, in other parts of the world. So in the territory, yes, is access, is inhabiting, is possibility to thrive, is possibility to be connected, is possibility to claim a space of centrality out of that exclusion. In other territory, more globally, or in other condition, that might be too abstract or too distant the right to the city. And therefore, the notion of inhabitation could be a way, a step through that. Uh, but it's not definitely antagonist or different uh, than that. On the romanticization, oh, I think every, every of us working in this condition has the trouble of romanticizing. Uh, but I think an antidote for romanticizing is that any solution, any, any reflection, any strategy to, is a contingent to the struggle, is contingent to the struggle between bodies and shapes and, and forms. So there is a possibility to romanticize, but in any, in any reflection, the romanticization, the antidote to the romanticization is thinking politically and to re-embrace the political attitude and the political dimensions of those strategy that we can develop. Although it's always a risk because romanticization is also one of the strategy of uh, the capital, one of the strategy of the, the dominance, one of the strategy of the racial capitalist system uh, to reduce the power of the claim and the struggle to something that is romantic. So there are some authors that says that in order to reduce that, we have to go back to the flashes, to the bodies, but the bodies in the material condition. And I think we are not really able to romanticize the body if we share the struggle. Thank you very much for the sharing your ideas. Uh, we have um, uh, another question uh, from Louisa Dyer, and she's asking, uh, is this experience of precarity of the camps also part of the general neoliberal world, I guess, world we live today? Is the 19 COVID uh, uh, intensifying the situation or you see new possibilities in this, in, in the actual reality? So if it's connected to the general neoliberal world that we live It's a very interesting question. Uh, both. Yeah, yeah. 
neoliberal capitalist, extractive, colonial, dark, uh, call it the way we want. We know what we are speaking about. And I think this is certainly the manner around which we are marginalized and render precarious. I think the COVID has added in, as we all know, has transcended, has accelerated some of the path, has rendered bare, ex expandable, uh, sacrificable some life rather than other. But I think in any in any situation, there is always a, a light, no? there's always a, a last set of resistance. Foucault was very clear into that. Any, anywhere there is a power, there is a resistance. Now, resistance in that sense is not neither a revolution or a new possibility, but are, to me, what I call the line of fight. So, possible minimum cracks where differences, new possibilities are emerging. In here, the colonial thinking that Catherine Welsh, Walter Mignolo, uh, Boaventura dos Santos, and numbers of 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 of, 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 of critical thinkers, sociologists, and anthropologists are definitely useful to think this idea. And the idea that there is always a possibilities until the end, and there is always a possibilities of new alliances and new practices that are emerging. If the virus is, is, is suggesting something, is that we are adapting to a numbers of, 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 of practices to solidarity, to proximity, to holding together. The question is that this is exceptional for some, but is the condition of normality and the everyday for the many. And I think this is what I think is very important. We have to learn from the precarious conditions in which many of the communities were and coping, and they were coping together much better than in some of the places that we know in the US or in Europe. So I do believe there is always the possibility to look at this light, this little tiny emergence of new possibility. Sometimes those possibilities are very at scale, very limited, uh, but they're always possible to be constructed in a new discourse. Uh, and at the moment, probably the discourse about COVID is finding new words to describe the situation and find a new strategy to address the situation outside of the precarity that that's accelerating uh, the the you know the the vulnerabilities and uh, being sacrificable uh, for some uh, the technology of the biopolitical however you would call it they are continuously change and we are subject to that in term, terms of that. I like a terminology recently more often, which is the idea of viscosity of plasticity. And it's something that uh, the, the life is very imperfect and we always have this possibility to think otherwise. So I do believe you're right, but we have to, li to look at those little sentences and to make alliances to, I mean, Donna Haraway would say, stop making baby, make kin, which is a sort of trap very interesting, which is the idea of making kin, of making new alliances between different bodies of thoughts, bodies of individual, bodies of geographies, bodies to think differently uh, that oppression mechanisms. Thank you very much for the answer. I was also like in, in this question, the previous question and this question, I was also thinking about how the the favela and the camps, they are both uh, uh, a fight for inclusion. Perhaps we lost a little bit the connection with him. Uh, so let's wait a little bit to, to regain the connection. But uh, I what I was commenting is also how both uh, the favela and the camps are a fight for inclusion also. People are like uh, struggling the way they, they can. But at the same time, this is also, and I think uh, what his position it's about you know what uh, this discussion is about is that uh, it's not just a matter of being an externality from the system it's also part of the functionality of the system or what he was saying like a, a matrix of uh, organization or a matrix of uh, framing the ways that you can uh, that you can live uh, we have still some questions from the audience, and we're gonna see if uh, uh, he can uh, manage to to come back. So perhaps we can uh, wait a little bit. Uh, 
while we do that, uh, maybe I can show you a little bit of the program and uh, the other so we we get uh, this information from the next uh, from the next uh, uh, sentence. But uh, here it's uh, Camilo again. Sorry, uh, hold down. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I was just commenting that uh, in the two questions, I was wondering that uh, also both the camp and the favelas are a way of people to fight for getting inside a better live or closer to the city or to a country where there is no war or there is less problem. So it's also part of a system. But I was wondering maybe your thinking is that uh, that's not only in uh, 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 externality of the system. It's part of how the system operates that puts people and creates subjects that are like in, in a lower quality, in a lower uh, set of uh, rights and values. So this Absolutely. ends up like uh, working in that matrix that you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, thank you. If you want to comment something else. No, no, or... no. That's absolutely, absolutely what I was trying to see them into a system of, of course, of uh, a much broader system that use them as a technology rather than, of course, they are they are never con completely abandoned by themselves, but they are also full of politics, of struggle, of rebellious, of claim towards uh, cities or any other right. So they are, and this is the fundamental critique to the original dimension of exclusionary and exception. It's not something completely abandoned, but it's always something that has this germ that I call inhabitation to reclaim back the possibility of a different life. Nice. Uh, we have one more question, so uh, I'm going to share with you. It's from Renato Cirino, which is a professor of um, in the field of arts. And uh, uh, the, he's asking about the ordinary sense that I have about uh, refugee camps is that uh, they are formed by some brutal force from dictatorship relations, war conflicts, and socioeconomic issues. How to justify or how is justified this fragile reality in democratic spaces through the precary urban environment and terrible life pers uh, perspectives? Uh, what is the true power of the people? We have uh, some power. Do we have some power? Oh, that's a very, very interesting question. I'm not sure about the genealogy. Camp, now there are people that are using the terminology camp studies, right, to, 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 to coalesce, you know, to, to construct the idea that camps means different things, um, different territory. Uh, the use of the terminology geo, geo, um, um, geohistorically has been, of course, the one of colonial, the one of uh, the death camp and the the one that you mentioned, and of course the humanitarian camp or the migration camps or the refugee camps that we are having. So they, they in reality, serves, have served in the history both uh, agency, the agency of kill, disrupt, and the agency of saving lives. Now when this idea, the, this tension that I've called biopolitics or the biopolitics of life, were emerging, we're actually uh, constructing them as a technology of either protection or uh, cancellation. Uh, Paul Gilroy, uh, which is a colleague of the UCL, very famous uh, critical scholar, he says that the concentration camps are to more, much more comparison, to be compared, compa compare in the sense of to be thought together with, uh, um, with uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, slave plantations. Uh, because they constitute exceptional space where normal, juridical, and procedural has been set aside. They are not, com they're not exceptional, not comparable, but they are relational. And I think this is the very fundamental tensions that we might need to think, which is that in any of those historically dimension, we have seized both the abyss and the possibility of a redemption. Now, the tensions between the two, to me, are very fundamental. So if you ask, do we have 
power, I do think we do have power. Now, what that power means and what that condition would, 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 would look like, that is a different condition that has been historically treated. For example, treating in a certain version, the idea of imagining traject alternative trajectories, alternative uh, 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 plans uh, in other forms were alliances, in other forms was simply memory and histories and, and reflections and narratives. So Agamben says that the only way to think about the abyss is to use poetry. And poetry, not because the poetry is the, you know, the aesthetics of it or the, the beautiness of that or the literature dimension, but because beauty, the poetry is a language that can never be captured by a linguistic. You always have a different significance that you would give to the poetry. And I find it, this is extremely important. Poetry today could be rap, could be, you know, black music, could be any music that is, any expression that is not captured immediately and so became again oppressive. In the tension between the urban, it's, it's a bit risky and I've been trying to resist the simple just opposition between camps and favelas or slum because this is an easy version. And the easy version we should always avoid easiness and simplicity and simplification. There are more complex territorial conditions. There are very complex spatial dimension. But of course, there is a tension between us, individual, collective life, and what I call inhabitation, and the living together. The collectivity for me is the right to the city and the possibility to claim that full, full meaningful life. And I think that is what we all have to probably aim to struggle for. Thank you. I think you bring uh, to the discussion uh, uh, somehow the geopolitics behind the practice of architecture, and um, and then somehow like uh, connecting to to this last question uh, of uh, how what's the power of people and uh, if we had some power. And I, I would uh, like to know from you how you see, like, uh, in this geopolitics of architecture, what is the power of uh, the architects? And uh, do we have any power when we, and uh, how can we use architecture as an instrument of uh, social change and interfering in the social processes? Well, yeah, that's very interesting. Again, super interesting question. I've been trying to. Uh, to work on that. Architecture is both complicit and emancipatory, is never one or the other. It's always the two. And I think we have a very fundamental individual choice to use it uh, collectively, intelligently. It's always a rebellious one. It's always not conforming. It's always thinking alternative and it's always not trying not to be complicit. Sometimes we are able to do it, other times we are not. Uh, and I think we need to look at this idea. I've been recently tried to work with this idea of the statement. So something that is always, always thinking its own action, but also the impossibility of its own action. And I ask myself, could I not do rather than do? And if I'm going into that version of resisting myself, so finding an alternative, a con holding myself and therefore holding the project of architecture of urban to immediately finding a solution, maybe we, we phrase a question differently. Sometimes this is much more easy and has been going into the collective, sometimes has been going back to a different terms, a different undoing of the, the project of the story. So I think we always have the possibility to, and the power, if you want, is never given, but it's always a relation. So it's always constructed among alliances, among individual, among institution. It's always find, found into the being, the act. It's never simply given. So the question is, maybe the question that was, we have power, yes, we do, but when and how? And I think that is what we have to ask ourselves. We always have it in action. And I, therefore, the question to think is what might be the different project to ask? Is a project that is resisting? Is a project that is resistance? Is an alternative? And I think this idea of undoing something very minor uh, and thinking the effect. I think what we are often doing is we are constructed by our own mirror rather than thinking on the effect that our individual project we do. So architecture as is not a messianic, is not a salvation, and we shouldn't give too much credit of it, but then we have to refill it with its own 
political, uh, intellectual uh, dimension. Thank you very much for these words and uh, for this uh, commentary, that which is both like encouraging and challenging, <laughs> because it's a uh, it's a hard, but it's also a process that uh, to to recognize these these matters, these questions, these issues that they are also inside architecture. I think it's a a great uh, deal. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, sharing your research. I, I'm we are very glad and thank you everybody that was watching us so uh, or the video or the or, or the live. And uh, I would like just to to share a little bit uh, the the contents of the the next presentations because this is part of the uh, of a series. So we're gonna have. Uh, on Friday now, one more uh, lecture, and also in the next week, uh, Wednesday and Friday. And uh, I hope uh, 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 in next uh, Friday now, our next lecture is going to be from uh, Douglas Spencer, which uh, it, it will discuss about the dialectics of nature and capital, subjects of the eco-imaginary, also a critical theory about um, um, let's say the rhetorical use of uh, uh, sustainability and how it's also filled with uh, sociologics, let's say. And uh, so again, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. And uh, if you wanna make some final considerations. Oh, for, I wish, I, I really thank you very much. It's been a privilege. Thank you, Camilo. Thank you, everyone. I really suffer not, you know, it's very difficult, this setting, but it's also very beautiful to connect with many people, with many projects. I really hope uh, everyone to take care. I think this moment is a moment where we have to take care of each other very strongly and showing proximity and showing solidarity with everyone uh, across all the different uh, latitude of the world. I think it's very important. So we're probably privileged. For sure, I am a privileged person in this moment. So thank you very much for having me. And um, thank you for allowing me the space and the energy to, uh, for the questions, uh, to share the thoughts and continue meaningful conversation with you all. Take good care and thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a final thanks to the students that were working with us and the technicians also, Renato, Wilder and Katia and the students Maria, Marilia, Luisa and Kairene. So thank you and see you in the next event. It was a great experience.